Uh, welcome back. Uh, welcome back. I hope you all enjoyed uh, the wonderful lunch. Uh, and more than that, I hope that the conversation of the last two panels have stimulated you enough. Uh, and as we've been mentioning again and again, the conversations are linked. Uh, and, and part of the idea of the whole conference, I guess, is to not only make those linkages, but then to start thinking about how to deal with those linkages uh, in, in, in this critical issue uh, of the future of food. And the linkage that we want to highlight uh, in this panel, and again, a number of these issues have come up again uh, in the earlier panels, but we want to sort of pick on them much more precisely in this panel, is uh, our issues of food safety uh, and uh, ecology, or this in, in this new ecology, what does food safety mean? Uh, the um, the focus issue in that regards very often in the debates is the issue of uh, GMOs, of genetically modified uh, organisms, uh, and that becomes a particularly thorny policy issue. I myself work mostly on developing countries, and particularly on developing countries in Africa, and it is kind of, and I say this with due humility, my, my colleagues might, might um, uh, kick me for saying this, but it is kind of interesting that in that debate, which is in many ways a US-EU debate, uh, it is many other countries also who get tied in, who might not have as much to say in the debate, but who's, who get impacted in very, re very real ways uh, in, in, in this. But it's one of the more important debates of our time in relation to food, but also in relation to science policy and in relation to how we deal with science policy. So that's the type of issues that we want to think about um, in uh, GMO issues, uh, issues of um, uh, genetic modifications, issues of biological sciences, uh, developments in food technologies, and so on and so forth. We have three uh, wonderful uh, speakers with us. We have uh, Andrew Kimbrell, who is the executive director of the Center for Food Safety. He will be going first. Uh, he will be followed by Helen Holder from the Friends of Earth Europe. And we will end um, with having a um, talk by Benny Herlin of the Foundation for Future of Farming and Save Our Seeds. We've already heard from him in the last uh, panel and and he'll be he'll be extending that argument or adding to that argument uh, and we very much look forward to that so without further ado Andy all yours we have asked the speakers to take about 15 minutes each and then we'll open up for Q&A great thank you very much um, I should point out right away that I am uh, I'm not a farmer or anyone who actually deals directly with I'm an attorney and which is appropriate here at the law school and not only that I'm a Washington DC attorney uh, which is some of the lowest life forms I know. Um, <laughs> I was once asked by a cab driver in D.C. what the difference is between a, a lawyer and a sperm. And I'm, I'm supposed to be a bioethicist, but I couldn't come up with an answer. And he said, well, a sperm has at least a one in one million shot of becoming a human being. <laughs> he then said that also works has a one in one million shot of actually working. Um, but I, I'm, I'm the kind of lawyer that I, mean, I basically sue the government in Monsanto for a living um, and have been doing it for 20 years. And, um, you know, one of the... Kind of <laughs> and uh, and um, we, recently, uh, we recently have had some good success. I don't know if you're aware of it, but we were able to stop uh, through a federal lawsuit uh, any sale or, or planting of genetically engineered alfalfa, and that's been upheld by a circuit court. Uh, we have also been able to stop genetically engineered wheat, uh, genetically engineered rice, genetically engineered fish, and we're currently in court on genetically engineered sugar beets. So we really have, you know, right now, if you're looking at the genetic engineering situation, they really only have four crops. They started in 1997 as, you know, basically corn, cotton, uh, canola, and soy. And uh, about 81 percent, I mean, I like to start any discussion of genetic engineering. I'm going to get a little bit broader, but I just want to get this out right away because you know, every time I read a, a magazine article or hear something on NPR about genetic engineered foods, they say, well, genetic engineered foods which are creating more yield, less pesticide, more nutrition. And that's all science fiction, uh, totally science fiction. 81% uh, uh, of all the crops out there are out there for one reason and one reason alone. They allow mass application of herbicides, right? Normally, if you spray herbicides on weeds and it gets on the crop, what happens to the crop? It dies, right? Herbicides kill anything that's green. Uh, but what they've been able to do through just a fairly 
simple engineering trick is make sure those crops can withstand massive amounts of herbicide. So that's what's happened, right? We've had over about 800,000 more tons of herbicide spread on our crops in the last 10 years since this stuff came on. That's what it is. And who are the companies? Monsanto, right? Dow, DuPont, Syngenta, and Bayer. What do they share? What, are they all, what, what kind of companies are they? Chemical companies, exactly. And that's what this technology is really about. When you break down all of the lies, all of the misinformation, all the myths, it's chemical companies selling chemicals. And they've done a very good job of that. It's good for them. It's bad for us, bad for the crops, bad for the soil, bad for the water, but uh, they're making a lot of money on it. But of course it's planned obsolescence because they're spraying so much Roundup now that all these weeds are becoming resistant to it. So if you look at all the new Monsanto plants, right, they're, they're, they're triple stacked, as they call that. So it's not just Roundup now, it's 2,4-D and it's all these other pesticides that they're also resistant to, you know, they're also resistant to. So we're, we're, we're breeding this whole new uh, group of, they call them super weeds, uh, which can withstand almost any kind of uh, herbicide and still live. So it's planned obsolescence. It's going to leave us with an environmental nightmare. Uh, and, uh, but meanwhile, they'll make money up to almost the very end as far as selling more and more of their herbicide. Uh, but I wanted to put this in context, particularly with the very uh, visionary name of this conference a little bit, and, uh, and talk about sort of how we got here, spend five or six minutes talking about that. And um, I'm old enough, uh, not too many people in this audience are, but some of us old, do people remember um, Better Living Through Chemistry? Some people? <laughs> Yeah, uh -huh. and progress is our middle name. I remember, and and I, uh, Marty Mellon, who's this great scientist, a you know, concerned scientist, she showed me an ad once that said DDT is good for me. And it was a woman singing this, I kid you not, coming out of her farmhouse singing this. And on top it said, you know, eighth notes and sixteenth notes, DDT is good for me. And it's good for my children, it's good for the farm animals, you know, it's wonderful for everyone. And uh, when I was a kid, there was a show on television called The Jetsons. Anybody seen the Jetsons? Yeah. yeah, what do the Jetsons eat? They eat little pills, right. They ate them with a knife and fork, which I always find kind of curious. You know, what do you need a knife and fork to eat your pills with? And they had this orange liquid they drank. And I was a kid, we thought it was Tang, which was the drink of the astronauts, uh, which is why some of them probably were so troubled later in life. Um, but, you know, behind that, it, it, all those things, it was really during my lifetime, which is post-World War II, was the, really the industrialization of agriculture that we see today. And that was the, this tremendous revolution in agriculture. And it was more and more artificial. It, its dream was that we'd end up with vitamin pills and tang. And you're talking massive inputs of chemicals, massive machinery, uh, monopoly ownership, monoculturing. That was the dream of, of, of modern agriculture for quite a while. And it, and it, it, it went along with a the, with the demographic shift. During that time, we were going from a, a rural country to an urban country. So all of these things were happening at an enormous distance. So in my lifetime, right, we've lost about uh, 12 million farmers, about 6 million farms. There are so few farmers left in our country that it's not even a, uh, a slot on when you, do, when you take your census, look for a farmer, you won't find it. There's not enough farmers. You have to put it under other, right? We've, speaking of commercial seeds, we've lost over 95% of our biodiversity. 75% of all of the animals and plants on the endangered species list are there because of farming and ranching. Right. And um, recently, uh, we did a study uh, in our Monsanto video as farmers where we looked at the suicide rates of farmers. Suicide, uh, farmers had the highest suicide rate of any population per capita in the United States, more than policemen and psychotherapists, which are two and three. Um, and uh, so when I, the book you'll see out there that we edited called Fatal Harvest is not rhetorical. And they thought they were going to get away with this. They thought this was going to be the future of agriculture. They thought they were going to have a more and more mechanized agriculture, and it was just going to go on forever to their profit. But something happened on the way that they did not expect. This tremendous distance between the rural population and the urban population, this enormous distance where these crimes against biodiversity and soil and farmers, these real crimes against nature that they were committing were hidden. People started to make the connections. One of the first is a great hero of mine. It's her 100th anniversary, and it's Rachel Carson. Rachel wrote this beautiful book called Silent Spring, uh, which I recommend to all of you who haven't read it. It is a fantastic book. And she said, you know, you cannot spray these chemicals and not remember, see what's going to happen, right? Right? Gets in the leaves, leaves get in the ground, worms get contaminated with birds, eat the worms, worms get the chemicals. No offspring, silent spring. 
make the connections. And there was a great man who I had the privilege of meeting and working with, Cesar Chavez. And he said to all the consumers out there, don't you dare buy grapes without thinking of the hands that picked them. You know, what, who are these families? What's happening to their children? What about the pesticide poisoning, not just of your food, but of their bodies and their children? What about their education? You cannot be a responsible citizen and not take that as an ethical challenge when you buy food. They started making the connection in 1969. Organic began in Maine and then in California. And right now, it's the fastest growing segment in American agriculture. Last year, even with this uh, you know, recession slash depression, we just got the figures yesterday, 17% growth. So there was a huge organic movement. And now we're seeing what's, what's something that so many of you at lunch were talking about and it's so exciting, organic and beyond. We're saying we want to defend the organic standards against the attacks, particularly the Bush administration. But we also want to evolve the ethic. We want to have food that's local, appropriate scale, humane, which is very important to me because the, and talk about the crime, think of the 10 billion animals that are tortured in our factory farming system every year in this country. So you have local, appropriate scale, humane, biodiverse and socially just. And if you do all those five, you don't have to worry too much about your carbon footprint. You can get rid of that as well. So that's the, what I call the organic and beyond. So this is very exciting. We are at this extraordinary moment in the future of food for the 21st century. You have the industrial model going one way, the organic and beyond going the other way, and we're right in the middle of that. And unfortunately, the industrial folks have not stopped. Right? They're now with genetic engineering and nanotechnology trying to change the permanent heredity of plants through nanotechnology and genetic engineering to suit their profit needs, including mostly spreading of chemicals. So, how am I doing on time? Okay, good. So, there's a couple of things I want to get to behind this as well that we need to think about. And one is, if people were at this conference, they would go, you know, this is all very nice, but it's, this kind of farming is not efficient, right? Well, we've had a number of international studies now that show that actually the most efficient kind of farming is medium-sized organic biodiverse farming. It's coming out of FAO, it's coming out of the World Health Organization, it's coming out of the UN. But even with that, you know, efficiency, you know, who's against efficiency? Well, what if I were to tell you I have two children, which I do, and I treat them very efficiently? <laughs> you, know, you know what efficiency is, right? Right? Maximum output, right? A minimum time. Right? With minimum input. So a minimum input of, of affection and food for best grades and best behavior, right? That's how you treat your kids, isn't it? Isn't it? Right? That's how you treat your friends, right? Get a call, two in the morning, Andy, Joe just left me. Sorry, I have to do a, a panel tomorrow. Inefficient friend. <laughs> I just lost my beloved English setter after 12 and a half wonderful years. And she was the least efficient creature on earth. She did no work whatsoever, and I lavished attention and food on her. Do we treat the things we truly care about merely on an efficiency basis? No. What do we treat them with? Empathy, love, right? Which is what Obama says is going to be his basis for picking the next Supreme Court justice. Somebody who has empathy. And I said, we cannot be good farmers. We cannot be good stewards unless we balance the efficiency of our systems with empathy and love for the plants, for the soil, for the farm communities and the farmers. All right? We also say, well, okay, but how are we going to be competitive with this new model of sustainable agriculture, Andrew? You know, everybody else is going to do genetic engineering and do these herbicides. And again, what if I told you that uh, I treated my kids with the ethic of competition? My daughter, you got an A. My son, you got a C. Sorry, you're gone. You are the weakest link. <laughs> I'm preparing you for the global market. All right, what, what, what do we really treat? How do we really grow as a, as a community? How do you grow as an agricultural community? Through cooperation which is happening throughout New England, by the way, and elsewhere. We're seeing new cooperatives develop. We're seeing you know, CSAs develop. We're seeing new, uh, we were just talking at lunch, university to school programs. These, we're seeing a whole new model of non-traditional food distribution happening. And we're saying we need to balance empathy with, uh, efficiency with empathy. We need to balance competition with uh, cooperation. And we're not going to say that technology equals progress. One of the great things about the organic movement is that it was a revolution in thought for Western civilization. For the very first time, we said technology does not equal progress. Pesticides, genetic engineering, sewage sludge, radiation, those are not, that's not progress. Maybe the corporation's idea of progress, they can make money on that. We are saying progress means saying no to them. And we have to remember that tremendous importance of organic is that it's this stand in the ground saying, no, we are, we, progress means working with nature, not against nature. 
And I think the empowering thing about this, and I can talk some more details on GMOs in the question and answer, is that, you know, Ralph Nader was a teacher of mine, but I don't like this word consumer. And I think another consciousness raising thing we can do together is to say, we reject that. Consumer, consumption used to be, TB used to be called consumption because they ate the body, right? We used to have consuming fires. I don't want to be that. Whether we like it or not, and I'm not always at the top of this hill, we're creators. Every decision we make about the food we grow, the food we eat, how we cook that food, we are creating a different future for the soil, for the earth, for ourselves, for the health of our families, for the health of our farm communities. We are creating it, whether we go to a fast food place, that's one kind of future, or whether we go organic and beyond, that's another kind of future. And each of us, including me, are doing that every day. So this isn't just a political issue, it's an, a profoundly ethical issue that we're talking about today. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, thanks, Andy, for that inspirational and, and, and uh, um, uh, discussion, and I think just the right thing to bring us back from the stupor that lunch might have taken us into. Uh, we're going to move on to um, Helen Holder from Friends of Earth Europe. Uh, we might, the rest of us will move down just so that we can see her slides. Uh, so, Helen, all yours? <laughs> Do I have to press something? No, I don't. Okay. Thank you. Um, so um, I come from Friends of the Earth Europe, um, which is, uh, and I work in Brussels in Belgium. And so I'll be speaking a little bit from the European uh, perspective, uh, focusing on genetically modified crops. Uh, just for your background information, we're a federation of 70 national uh, organizations. We have a Friends of the Earth United States as well campaign for social and environmental justice around the world. We are the biggest grassroots organization uh, in the world. And in Europe, we have 31 member organizations. So that means EU 27, but a bit more as well. And I work in the Secretariat in Brussels. And our main areas of work are economic justice, climate and energy, food and biodiversity. So that was just for the, for the background. So GMOs, the GMO controversy in Europe uh, I would imagine that you followed this to a certain extent, but just to set the context, much of this blew up in the 90s, mid-90s, where in Europe there's a very deep traditional food culture. Now this may vary between one country and another, obviously coming from the United Kingdom, I, I hesitate to take on such a strong food culture as maybe is present in France or Italy, but nevertheless it is important. But also, because of uh, the industrialization of agriculture, we had also experienced a number of food scares, and in particular, um, mad cow disease, which had put the European public's faith at an all-time low um, in uh, food agencies and government agencies. And then finally, another thing that I think contributed quite strongly was that Monsanto at that time decided to launch a rather aggressive PR campaign in Europe with uh, full-page articles in newspapers and magazines saying GM crops will food feed the world, look at these beautiful tomatoes, etc., etc. And with the other two elements and the idea of genetically modifying food in the cultural context of the EU, that was a little bit of a red rag to a bull. And so that resulted in very strong public outcry on GM foods, nonviolent direct action, strong support, including courts finding in favour of activists, very strong media attention. Um, <clears throat> therefore, governments became under very, came under very strong pressure. Um, and EU laws that were already in place um, for the authorisation of GM crops or novel foods came under review. Interestingly, not only because of the opposition of GM crops, um, but also because even industry, as one of the stakeholders, was not very happy with the current framework. And during that time, while these laws were, refu were, were reviewed, a de facto moratorium actually came into place, where the um, members of the European Union, the countries of the European Union, decided that they would not authorise any new GM crops until we had a legal framework in place. And this, of course, sent a very strong message around the globe, so not only important for Europe, but globally of relevance as well. So this legal review lasted until the early 2000s. A number of new laws came into being, including a law establishing um, a European Food Safety Authority. And this probably led to the best biosafety laws in, in the world, 
But as ever, implementation is far from perfect, and this is some of the things, given the focus of this workshop, that I'll, I'll run through briefly. So the main points in the law were that they were based on the precautionary principle, as all EU environmental law is supposed to be. Conventional and GM foods were not considered to be like. My understanding is that in the US this is the basic point. In the U EU, GMO foods were seen to be different. Um, a country was given the right under EU law to ban an individual GMO for health and environmental reasons. This is called the safeguard clause. Um, there were quite strong risk assessment requirements placed under the, under the laws. Labelling was put in place, although a loophole um, was present from the start whereby animal products from animals fed with GMOs were not labelled. So dairy, eggs, um, milk um, are not are not labelled. And uh, a GMO, if approved, has to be reapproved every 10 years <clears throat> just to check on the latest information, so on and so forth. So in theory, pretty good, really. So I just want to talk about two main points. First of all, look at this in a little bit more detail, the risk assessment component. And second of all, look at the transatlantic issue, and in particular, the WTO dispute. Um, where we are with that now, and latest challenges um, in between the EU and the US. So, how GMOs are approved in the EU. Now, the new laws, the new legal framework, set up an independent agency for risk assessment, and this is called the European Food Safety Authority, EFSA. And the role of this authority is to provide advice to decision makers, and it is supposed to be independent from the interests of member states and of industry. And risk management is the responsibility of our administrative body, the European Commission. And this administrative body, to take a decision, will look at the EFSA's opinion, take into account other scientific advice, information, other information, and then will put a proposal to the member states saying, yes, this should be authorised, no, this shouldn't be authorised, and then it goes for the vote. That's, that's in theory. So its obligations are to take into account the EFSA opinion, other evidence, socio-economic implications, scientific uncertainty. So where there's unclarity, uncertainty. And the EFSA must look into um, what national scientific um, bodies are saying, what their views are, what their analysis is, look at long-term impact assessments on health and the environment, consider diverging scientific opinion, and also take scientific uncertainty into account. So there's a double layer almost of taking into account the issues of scientific uh, uh, research and uncertainty. Again, in theory, very good. Now this is um, a diagram that I think is um, very useful, which is uh, from my colleague Marco in, um, in the Greenpeace uh, office in Brussels, which shows you how the EU authorization system should work in, in theory. <laughs> Um, so the data comes from the company, it's looked at in relation to other um, uh, factors, there's an opinion that comes out, some uncertainty is, uh, is factored in, feasibility of control, so can we control um, this GMO once it's on the market, precautionary principle, underlying principle, a risk manager concludes, and then it goes for a decision. But what actually happens in practice, oops, is slightly different. What we've seen since ESSA came into being, say 2002 approximately, is that biotech companies are not asked to submit evidence of long-term impact assessments. Um, the EFSA has taken its independent role from member states rather far, which means it ignores anything that it's told. Um, it's shown no evidence of taking scientific uncertainty into account and no acknowledgement of any scientific controversy um, uh, in terms of risk assessment or in terms of impacts of GM crops. So you basically have a small, rather untransparent group of, what, 20 scientists taking all the decisions. And within this group of scientists, we found that the area of expertise is very narrow. So most people are molecular biologists, which is fine, but there's very little in terms of ecology and other areas of expertise. We actually looked at the scientists working on GMOs in EFSA in 2004, and we found that one had direct financial links with the biotech industry, others have un had indirect, indirect links. Two members actually appeared on a promotional video produced by the biotech industry. Several members um, of the panel were on an EU-funded research project, which was to facilitate market introduction of GMOs in Europe, 
and therefore bring the European industry in a competitive position, not the most neutral project, one could say. Um, and the chair is actually on a working group of this project with Monsanto, Biocrop Science and Syngenta. And, and experts that they, they used um, were either not published, so we didn't know who they were, but we did find out that one of them had previously worked for the biotech corporations. Now, the people on the panel have changed since then, but this is just to illustrate how, in fact, a supposed independent authority was quite obviously working in a very different way. And what has happened ever since that the EFSA was, was created is that every single opinion it's been asked to give on GMOs have been in favour. Every single time, you could almost copy and paste, they're basically saying, yes, it's fine, you can authorise, which, given their links with the industry, is perhaps not very surprising. In terms of what happens in practice when you look at the European Commission, um, there is no evidence of them assessing available uh, scientific evidence from other sources. They have never taken into account socio-economic implications in any visible way. They don't take scientific uncertainty on board. And when once the Environment Commissioner, that's the equivalent to a, a minister, um, actually said that he felt that there was new scientific evidence that justified not authorising um, two new GMAs for cultivation and proposed to put, to the vote, put this to the vote for member states. It was knocked out by other members of the European Commission who were pretty clearly pro-GMO. And what happens in practice is that as soon as the EFSA gives its opinion, which, as you saw, is only one chain in the link, the European Commission goes with it, and you can't raise any problems, you can't raise any issues, EFSA has said it's okay, it's okay, therefore we follow the EFSA as the law. And this is going back to the diagram of Greenpeace, which I think is very well done, shows you what happens in practice. So a whole load of that is just ignored, and the red arrow shows how it all goes down to EFSA, basically, these 20 scientists making the decisions for the EU in terms of GMOs, and these scientists are 20 scientists, very heavily loaded on the molecular biology side, very close to industry. So basically, if you look at GMOs and democracy in the EU, um, the Commission is the risk manager, less than per perfect, puts a proposal to authorise GMOs to EU countries to a vote, and this proposal is systematically to authorise. It's always in favour. Now, what actually happens at the moment, and this is one of the, the more positive elements, is that the controversy still rages um, uh, in, in Europe on GMOs. And so member states, um, EU countries, are split and this means that there's never a clear vote, either in favour of authorising a GMO or against. So there's what's called a non-qualified majority, because as 27 member states, we have weighted voting. Um, this means, under EU rules, that it comes back to our administration, and our administration has to decide what it's going to do. But given that our administration, the European Commission, always follows the rather biased opinions of the European Food Safety Authority, it's no surprise that they systematically authorise all GMOs that come their way. They even go as far as to not take into account any predominant position that might come out when European Union countries vote. Now, not everything relies on the problems and failings of the European Commission. Um, it also needs to be uh, noted that European countries themselves often have some democratic deficits, in particular, for example, the UK, where you have, over the last 10 years, a, a substantial part of the population, more than half, against GM crops, but the government discreetly goes off to Brussels and votes in favour of all GM crops, again, because they are a very pro-GM government. In Sweden, for example, um, you have the mainstream farmers' organisations who have quite clearly said that they oppose GM crops. The Swedish government always votes in favour. Um, and in Spain, uh, similar, and you can find a number of countries. So we do have very, various areas of democratic deficit, but not everything is um, problematic. I just wanted to lay this out in order to be clear that not everything in the EU in relation to GMOs is perfect, that we, don't, we can block, we can use these laws, there's definitely room for manoeuvre and there's strong resistance, but there's also quite a big push to get GM, GM crops into the EU. Um, but what is positive is that the EU still remains relatively GM-free, partly because countries block, partly because public opinion stays high, partly because campaigning continues. 
So in fact, there was actually a reduction under the area of GM crop cultivation last year, and even and what we have now is absolutely minute. It's 0.06% of agricultural land, and 74% of this, which is already very small, is located in one single country. And over the last year, as I think Benny will, will tell you, um, additional countries have banned individual GMOs. And what's also interesting, given um, what's wrong with the approval system and what's wrong with risk assessments and uh, the notions of safety and so on, is that just at the end of last year, uh, EU environment ministers unanimously um, stated that, these, that our EU laws are not being implemented properly and called for various areas of um, progress, including um, socio-economic impact analysis, which, going back to what... Uh, you were saying is that in relation to pesticide use in the countries that do grow GM crops, for example, the evidence against is overwhelming. So there's a window of opportunity there. So the second part um, is just looking at the GMO status of Europe and, and what, this, um, what this means around the world. And of course, this comes up to the WTO level because US, Argentina and Canada, 2003, launch a dispute, as you, as you may have followed, because suddenly they could see that with the EU, a major trading partner potentially closing to GM crops, this was very bad for their own markets. Their export markets, suddenly maybe a GM-free market was going to come up that couldn't be compete, competed for. Contamination issues, if you have GM-free, then countries that are contaminated are problematic. And that by, by having resistance in the EU, there was slow adoption of GM crops um, around the world as other countries, other regions, Africa and so on, were watching what was happening in the EU and being strengthened in their own resistance by the EU opposition. Um, NGOs started campaigning, including a bite back campaign, don't force feed us GM, GM crops. And this, this dragged on for a number of years because it was highly controversial, um, highly problematic. Um, and so it was only in 2006 that the first news of what was coming out of this dispute um, actually started to, to come out. And this is what I wanted to talk about because it's extremely interesting at how this was done. The, court, the, the, the dispute was brought by the US and, um, and the other countries because they were worried about their markets, because they didn't want the EU to be able to ban individual GM crops, because they wanted the EU system for authorising GMOs to be discredited and to be thrown out. Very, very political, very controversial issue. So in 2006, the WTO, following its own rules, um, comes out with its uh, inter interim ruling. Now, under WTO rules, this is highly confidential. It goes to the parties. It doesn't go any further. Interestingly, the US administration claims victory and goes to the media. And suddenly, around the world, you have media reports based on a confidential document that nobody can read and nobody can check, um, saying, for example, that this is against, this will, this will be a message to the rest of the world against following the European lead in throwing up bans or partial bans against GM crops, picked up by major newspapers and agencies, and nobody can do anything because nobody can see the report. So we managed to get hold of it and leak the interim ruling out on the website in order to try and get information up on exactly what's happening. But to be honest, a lot of the damage had been done already. So the final ruling did come out in September 2006 and is extremely interesting because it does not put into question the EU's regulatory and policy regime on GMOs, nor the right of countries to ban individual GMOs. The moratorium that was in place, and which is no longer in place, so in fact is no longer relevant, was not, however, found to be illegal per se. And um, national bans were only found to... to to lack certain specific technical elements. So overall, the ruling was extremely nuanced and some of the basic ideas behind EU law were maintained or not criticised. But the damage had kind of been done with the message going out that the EU had essentially lost. And of course, this, this document is 1,500 pages of technical information and not very many people who are going to read this. And interestingly, the trade... Um, department of our administration of the European Commission decides to stay silent on this and again doesn't contribute to trying to get the proper information out. Um, 
the, the action of Friends of the Earth and other organisations in leaking these documents actually goes into the final ruling, um, with, interestingly, the United States asserting that it was apparent from the content of Friends of the Earth's briefing paper that no complaining party would have had reason to provide a copy of the findings to Friends of the Earth Europe, which is an implicit acknowledgement that, in fact, that outcomes of the ruling were actually pretty much in the favour of strong biosafety regulations. But once the, finding, the findings were out, the Commission then moved and started to push GM crops into Europe by getting bans dropped, having a lot of defeats in this respect, but still trying to get um, the bans dropped, trying to get Europe to open up more quickly to more GMOs. And what's interesting is that US, Argentina and Canada have kept the case open in inverted commas because this is a way of maintaining pressure on the EU. So even if the de facto moratorium is no longer in place and even if the national bans uh, on which they attacked the EU are pretty much gone save for one, by saying we'll prolong the period over which the EU has to be seen to be making the changes required, it can keep the pressure on. And I think that this is something that's quite troubling and, it, and it's an area where we need to focus in terms of getting the right information out there. Um, I've got some information that I won't go through, into here on what was going on behind the scenes during the WTO dispute, which is available on a report on our website. And then finally, um, documents that we got hold of through freedom of information requests, which showed discussions and meetings between the US ambassador and the EU um, in the outcome period of the, of the WTO um, dispute, which showed the US very clearly saying they wanted the EU to fast track GMOs of commercial interest, high level support to GMOs, which the commission complied with, lowering of contamination standards, um, and strategic approvals to give the message that the United States is winning the battle of ideas. The Commission, unfortunately, generally complied, including starting to attack internally um, our laws for contamination, uh, sorry, our import laws, which up until now have been very strict on the contamination of GMOs. And this, um, this zero tolerance rule, as, as it is called, um, is now the latest attack on um, weakening the laws for the EU, with, of course, an eye on what this means for the global market. And this is, without going through all of this in detail, because I, I will try to finish up, the, the basic point here is that the, Europe is very dependent on plant proteins. We import, and it's essentially soy, 78% of our needs in animal feed. Um, and what we've got in place in terms of GMOs is a rule whereby imports, whether they're GM or non-GM, cannot be contaminated with any GMO that has not been approved in the EU. The reason behind that is that if it hasn't gone through our risk assessment, then it's not coming in, even if it's in trace amounts. And this is called zero tolerance, and it's a pretty strict rule. And it's very obvious from what the, what the, the documents say that we obtained after the WTO dispute and other elements that have come to light that this is the next area of attack in, in our transatlantic relationship on GMOs. And this has been a, the area of a very strong lobby, including the US Chamber of Commerce, animal feed sector, oil seed sector, biotech lobby, etc., etc. And uh, the president of the European Commission has taken this quite happily on board, saying that the recent surge in agricultural commodity prices could be exacerbated by trade obstacles related to GMOs. But of course, as we heard this morning, it's a bit more complicated than that. Um, we basically looked at this and were able to see that our laws on um, contamination of imports are not posing a problem either to the EU livestock sector or to supply or in any way. Um, and to cut a long story short, we decided the best way to check this would be to go and see the Brazilian and Argentinian embassies. Brazil and Argentina are now the main suppliers of soy to the EU, who confirmed to us immediately that they could supply according to zero tolerance rules. And this is where you can see that it's very clearly a political issue, a commercial issue um, that's going on between the US and the EU, but it's not an issue about getting enough animal feed into the EU for our farmers. And in fact, the Financial Times picked this up, saying in, uh, in, in spring 2008, diplomatic sources in Brazil and Argentina, which supply almost all the EU's animal feed, um, also question the apocalyptic scenario. So 
this basically just shows that we don't actually need to drop these laws, just like we don't need to drop um, strict biosafety regulations. And again, this is not just relevant for the EU. This is relevant for any region in the world that wants to put in place laws and rules for imports, for contamination and for biosafety. If the EU can do it and can and go unchallenged at the WTO level, if its industries can continue functioning or its agricultural sectors can continue functioning, that's relevant for everybody. So finally... Um, the EU is not the pure anti-GM sector that we would like it to be, although it is essentially a force in the world. Um, the US continues to pressure via the WTO dispute and now is also trying to target GMO rules directly. But controversy and public resistance remain very high. And if the implementation of, of EU laws is problematic and less than perfect, it still provides a very important framework in which um, campaigners and, uh, can operate. And of course, as, uh, as you were saying, the economic and agronomic impact of GM crops is becoming clearer after 13 years of growing. Unfortunately, the United States is a case study, um, and that there is a need to raise awareness of this, just as there is a need to raise awareness of outcomes such as of the WTO dispute. And just to finish, I wanted to give a quote of uh, the president of the American Farm Bureau speaking to UK farmers where he was saying, I think the debate about higher prices and being able to meet the demand of people in the world for food is a perfect opportunity to make the case for GM crops. We may have a window of opportunity here, and I would encourage you to exploit this, which I think is a good example of transatlantic relationships. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um while you change that, let me just introduce the third speaker, who will also be using a PowerPoint, so you might want to keep your chair where it was. Uh, I th thank you. Thank you, Helen, for raising those points. I hope we will have a vigorous debate on this, because I, I, my own views are very much like the panel's, but, but as a moderator, I do feel that the panel might be, there might be other views on the other side. Who, who, uh, and my own concern on all of this is that while the transatlantic big game is being played, a lot of developing countries uh, feel being kicked around uh, between the two. Uh, on that provocative note, let me call uh, our, our, our third speaker, uh, Benny Halen, who I'm sure will also have uh, views on this. Thank you. OK, here I am again on a different topic. I would like to share with you the experience of this resistance in, uh, in Europe. And um, I think the first time I met Andy was now well more than 20 years ago when I was a member of the European Parliament and was heading to see and oppose the first uh, ever release of a genetically modified organism in Monterey County, which was called Ice Minus. It has not been a major success, actually. And I remember uh, I, met a, I met a nice farmer who was just neighboring the test field, and he was patrolling with his gun <laughs> to uh, fight back against those GMOs, which he believed had killed already his um, rabbit. And this is probably how the whole thing started and how it has been framed ever since, that the issue of GMOs was an issue of food safety. Will a GMO, when we eat it, will it kill us, will it uh, make us ill or whatever? And my personal experience, frankly, is that it is not an issue of food safety at all. Not in our campaigning, not in the perception of uh, the um, whole, uh, or of the broad majority of the people. And um, to a certain extent, I was always surprised when I tried to explain, especially in the early days, uh, to people what genetic engineering was and why I felt this was a bit premature, to say the least, and why we should first understand much better what this is, and so on and so forth. And after th three minutes maximum of me trying to explain the case against GMOs, people usually said, you just don't do this. 
and it was an absolute gut feeling. It had nothing to do with detailed pros and cons of, of, of scientific arguments on food safety or, or whatever. And I believe that is at the heart of the whole um, struggle because you might want to ask yourself why the heck those Europeans now since more than uh, 15 years are fighting tooth and nails against just one technology that so far directly as the technology hasn't killed a single person. Where there is no, or yeah, you're a few. <laughs> um, and I think it has much more to do with alienation on food on one side, and to that extent it had a relation to this BST crisis where people also felt, yeah, that's the punishment when you feed uh, cows uh, cow offal. And um, it also has to do with the feeling that it is probably not such a good idea to have a few companies control the whole diversity of plants uh, which are commercially uh, used. And it has to do with the, the um, what Andy was talking about, the feeling that progress is not necessarily to do everything you can do in the area of food. And I would like to just share with you, oh, not very well visible, a meeting we had uh, now uh, two weeks ago in Lucerne. It was the fifth uh, annual meeting of GMO-free regions in Europe, around 250 people from 38 countries who declared their territories GMO-free. I'll explain what that means in detail in a minute. But first, let me tell you who was there. This is the highest ranking uh, Swiss representative, the president of the uh, Swiss parliament. Next to her is a video designer from Ireland, next to her is uh, the um, Greenpeace campaigner from France, then an activist from uh, Japan, then our former Ag Minister and now head of the Green Party, Renate Künast, then a, a bearded activist from Hungary, the, to the right of him is the uh, president of the National Farmers Union of uh, Switzerland. Next to him is the Ag Minister of Austria. Then the, on the very left is a rather right-wing Polish uh, representative of a voivodeship. The guy with the long hair next to him is the Vice uh, Environmental Minister of uh, the Czech Republic, which attended because the Czech Republic is holding the EU presidency at this moment. Then you see Hans Herren, who is the chair of the IASTD. And then below, with a blue background, is an activist from Romania. And on the very right is Percy Schmeiser, who never misses a good party on uh, uh, GMO issues. <laughs> uh, to the left is a professor from uh, the Lisbon University who heads the campaign on GMOs there. Then uh, you see uh, Carlo Petrini, the founder of the um, slow food movement in Italy, and next to him the present uh, president of the regional uh, GMO-free governments uh, association, who is the uh, president of Tuscany. What I want to show with this uh, little overview is that it is really a very broad variety of views of people of uh, um, status, who all of these came there because they're convicted we should not have GMOs on our territory. Who did not come was our present, present Ag Minister, who will have to go to Washington the uh, day after tomorrow for the first time, and will have a really hard time because she has banned only recently the only GM crop that was allowed for growing in Germany. 
under the massive pressure of a broad uh, majority of Bavarians. Bavaria is uh, one of our uh, states in uh, Germany, and uh, the ruling party was about to lose a necessary majority in the next elections for the European Parliament had they not come up with such a ban. Now we have a national ban on GMOs actually in Germany, but she did not do this because she was convinced. She did it because she could not, she, she didn't have an alternative politically. And I think that is um, at this moment the situation in very many European countries. It is true there are a few who are not as opposed to GMOs as others. But when you look at this picture, this is uh, all the green uh, on this uh, card of Europe are GMO-free regions in different states. It's 196 uh, regions at the moment, 93 provinces, and 4,567 uh, municipalities, local uh, governments, who have declared their territory GMO-free. They're not allowed to do so. You've, uh, you've seen uh, what Helen just told us about the approval process, but they don't care. And in one way or the other, they have actually managed to keep their territory free from GM cultivation. This is not to say that none of the farmers would, would feed uh, uh, GM uh, soybeans to to his cows and, 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 and cattle. And that is a political movement which you could not imagine to just center around one technology. This is a political movement that has a much broader background and which uh, reflects what we've been discussing here, I think. It is the region's interest to present their products as quality products. That's the first and foremost economic uh, drive for most of these regions. In order to do so, they cannot be genetically engineered. In the eyes of the, of the customer, this is a contradiction in itself. It is a movement of, uh, of, of politicians who are looking from their political perspective, and that is certainly different from what we've discussed here so far, for a reconnection between the citizens and the farmers, between the citizens and the landscape, between uh, taking responsibility for the well-being of the region, of the municipality, what not. And that, as I see it, is the real background. Here you have an overview again on the um, on this club I have mentioned already of GMO-free regions governments. This is how they started, and this is where they are today. And these are no logos. These are, I think you call them arms, right? All of these signs here have long traditions. Some of them a thousand years old, some of them 500 years old, certainly this is the expression of a kind of regionalism that uh, feels threatened by GMOs and by this new concept of agriculture as an um, opportunity cost game, uh, which I think has an um, enormous future. And that is the situation as we have it at this moment, the dark green uh, member states have simply banned the cultivation of GM. The light green, in the light green uh, uh, areas, there is no cultivation for different uh, types of reasons. And uh, the striped countries are the only ones where there is a, uh, a cultivation of GMO. These are the figures of the GM industry, which basically shows what Helen already said. Uh, there is Spain with uh, 75,000 hectares, or now 79,000 hectares. Uh, a hectare is uh, 2.4 acres, so it's absolutely minute. It's negligible. And it will go down this year compared to 2008 uh, once more. And um, 
the perspective I see in this, uh, in this movement or in this uh, landscape of uh, Europe is that actually a controversy, a controversy which had a lot to do with how much do consumers have to say, how much uh, do politicians have to respect the fact that basically 70% of the European population says we don't want GMOs in our food. And how far can Monsanto on one side and Nestle and Unilever on the other side go against their own customers? And I think it is an example of how you can win something that I had been told when I started this whole campaign, <sighs> forget it. Had you come 10 years earlier, maybe there would have been a chance, right? GMOs are everywhere. You can't do nothing about it anymore. It's not true. And uh, things can change overnight. In many of these uh, member states, we have seen a shift of the government's position on these issues within <laughs> basically six weeks. And when we started the campaign on, on labeling, which is probably the, was the initial campaign, we just demanded that everything must be labeled where there is a GMO in it, right? Uh, we really had problems because all of the big brands, Nestle, Unilever, Mars, you name it, they all gave in before we could start uh, campaigning against them, which is from a campaigner's point of view sometimes a bit uh, boring and frustrating. <laughs> But uh, in terms of the effectiveness, whatever has to be labeled in a supermarket is GMO-free. The only problem we have, as has been mentioned, still is the animal feed issue. And the animal feed issue also, of course, raises the question, why is Europe 74% uh, protein import dependent? Number one, because we have huge animal factories that are number two, drawing from abroad. And number three, then exporting with subsidies of the public to countries where they kill the uh, local um, uh, farmers who cannot compete with the price of the chicken and the, and the, and the pigs uh, in Africa and Asia. And um, my feeling is that this will be the next discussion. It will not be just a discussion, can we get the uh, rest of the animal feed GM free, but why the heck do we have to import so much animal feed? Why the heck do we import soybeans which are grown on uh, land that has been uh, cleared from Amazon pristine uh, forests just to have more sausages in Germany? And I think there, there is the perspective, and the interesting thing is that uh, the broad range of political parties and movements uh, which are backing at this moment uh, the campaign against GM and, and basically have a clear stance on this will find it very difficult uh, not to also take a pretty clear stance on this question of food sovereignty. Why don't we grow our meat local? Why do we have to eat more meat than we can get uh, local? So I see the whole GM issue very much as an iconic and quite optimistic uh, lesson we have learned over the past 15 years in Europe. Thanks a lot. Thank you. My, my gratitude to all, all three of our speakers, Andy, Helen, uh, Benny, for, uh, for, for raising a whole host of very interesting and, and extremely important uh, issues. I'll uh, open it up to the floor. We'll take a few questions. Uh, can someone turn off that light that seems like sort of it's pointing right into my eyes right now? That's probably the, the <laughs> projector. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. If we could turn the projector off, that would be great. And anyone who wants to ask a question, we have two mics, one up there, one down here. We'll start with the, I think, gentleman at the back. 
who might be Henrik Selin. Okay, Henrik, it's, I can make you out in Chilouet. That's good. <laughs> uh, I have a question for Helen. So you criticized the uh, Europe uh, European um, Commission and the approval process of GMOs. Um, since um, the de facto moratorium was uh, lifted in 2004, how many new GMOs have been uh, approved for cultivation in Europe? We'll take a few other questions if we have any. Do we have any other comments, questions? Uh, gentlemen at the back in the black, I think. I'm familiar with some of the, uh, the, the bad things about GMOs, but I'm not sure how many other people in the audience are, and I'd like to hear what, why shouldn't we be eating GMOs? Why shouldn't we be genetically modifying foods and animals? Um, yeah, can you, can you guys touch on that a little bit? What's so bad about this anyway? Okay. We'll take one more and then I'll come back to the panel to take any of the questions. Uh, what about cross-contamination? I mean, uh, of GMO uh, selling seeds from one country to another, there are possibly GMO seeds and so, et cetera. It's happening here. What uh, Europe is probably the same thing. Okay. We'll take uh, just, just one more at the back. The lady. Um, at the my back. question is more about what's happening with GMOs in developing countries, because I know in college I was a biology major. We talked a lot about golden rice and how this was supposed to save people in starving countries. Rice with an increased protein content. So I was hoping you could touch on that a little bit. Thanks. Okay. So we have a bunch of questions rice. there. Uh, mm -hmm. Helen, you want to start because there was one specifically to you, and then anyone can take anything. Yes. Um, uh, yes, in terms of cultivation, um, like I was saying, we're looking at 0.06% of agricultural land in the EU, which is under GM crop cultivation, and Benny showed you the map of the GM-free regions. So, yes, there is hardly any GM crops being grown, and whilst there are problems with the EU authorization system, the good news is that there haven't been any new crops authorized for cultivation since 1998. And this is why there's only one GM crop, this is Monsanto's maize, um, called Monet 10, which is currently authorised for growing, which means that if a country currently bans that one GMO, there are no other GMOs to be grown uh, in the territory at all. So that's... Okay. That's the situation. You want to take any of the others? Um, in terms of um, cross contamination, um, yes. I mean, this is a this is a massive problem. The contamination issue. Um, there are different levels where contamination can can occur throughout the whole the whole chain of growing the crops between different fields, transport, processing, etc. The EU has taken the traceability angle a little bit more seriously, perhaps, than other regions, but one um, shortcoming in the laws in the EU are what's called coexistence, which is how crops are going to be grown, how it will happen between GM crops, non-GM crops, organic crops, and that's a bit of a blank at the moment. That's the... the um the reason that the federal court uh, in Ninth Circuit and then the circuit court supported the ban on genetic engine alfalfa was because uh, we provided indisputable evidence that the genetically engineered Roundup Ready alfalfa contaminated organic and conventional and therefore threatened dairies whose cows were feeding on these alfalfa that, that needed their organic certification. So, you know, the important thing to remember is that GM is not just another tool in the agricultural toolbox. It's a tool that takes over the toolbox. Y it will destroy uh, organic, because organic has to be GMO-free, or at least non-GMO non as far as pro uh, process is concerned. And, and this is really important, and I want to publicly thank uh, this man to my right. Uh, about 15 years ago, uh, Benny and Linda Bullard, uh, almost single-handedly at the European Union made sure that Europe didn't go the way of the United States. As most of you know, um, unfortunately, our FDA at the very end of the first Bush administration under the leadership of a man named Michael Taylor, who was uh, formerly a Monsanto attorney who was then uh, brought into the FDA to approve GMO crops, approved them without any mandatory labeling or testing, and said they were substantially equivalent and permanently granted them a, basically a, a pass on any kind of regulation. And they were pushing for this in Europe, and a couple of very courageous people stood up and said no and made sure. And I remember those phone calls and, the, and a lot of things that Benny and Linda had to do. And, you know, we often say that we stopped genetically engineered wheat in this country and genetically engineered rice, but this transatlantic dialogue was critical to that because 
if you're a wheat farmer in North Dakota or Montana, a huge amount of your income is exporting that wheat to Europe. Uh, and so even those farmers who had no issue with GM one or the other thought it might be a little more convenient for their herbicide use said no to GMOs because they saw their, literally the exports dying and they estimated that'd be a $400 million loss. We've already lost $500 million in corn exports that have lost because of the GMO contamination. And because of some rice contamination, just experimental rice contamination, we're up to about 800 million loss in exports to Japan and Europe. So because Europe has stayed strong, despite the, 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 the loopholes Helen was talking about, labeling, et cetera, has kept Europe strong, Japan and other countries strong, that means, gives us an enormous advantage as those of us who, who are working for better regulations of technology in the United States, because it means that for almost every export crop, uh, we're gonna have farmers on our side saying, no, we don't want this contamination because it'll destroy our export market. And that is because of the work that, uh, that you folks have done. Benny, on, on that note, and if you can also take the question about, so what is wrong with GMOs beyond contamination? Why, why are people worried about GMOs? And, and you mentioned a number of things, but. What is wrong with um, GMOs? I can give you my uh, nutshell uh, personal opinion on this. Is basically the concept from the scientific point of view is to interfere in a binary code of a program you don't know. And um, then you can have certain effects, obviously, right? You can have uh, this resistance effect, for instance, right? I found, it, I found it really interesting over the past 20 years how the fundamental dogma and assumption of genetic engineering, which is derived from this famous um, dogma of Mr. Crick, who has um, won the Nobel Prize for, for the uh, <clears throat> discovery of the DNA, which says DNA makes RNA, makes protein, and there is no way back. And that is exactly the underlying concept. You take a piece of DNA, you insert it into, a, uh, into the genome of a different uh, organism, right? You make sure it's turned on and turned off, and then it exactly uh, does what you have identified this piece of DNA does. One of the major blows to this theory was actually the Human Genome um, Project where we found out, uh, or where it was evidenced in a way many scientists had predicted uh, much earlier, that the round about 250,000 proteins the human body produces are actually uh, fabricated by a number of between uh, 20 and 30,000 genes. Now everybody can make the calculation. It is different, right? It is not DNA makes RNA makes protein. It's much more complicated. We have started to understand this, but long before we have a glimpse of really getting to how this works, a couple of companies have patented DNA claiming we have found this. It's, it's like, uh, like the conquerors uh, in the, uh, uh, in the early times of colonialism, right? We put our flag into this land and so we own it. Conquistadores. Because we have a new language for expressing what happens in a cell, we own it. And one question you may ask yourself, given the fact that uh, while there is strong resistance probably in Europe and many other countries of this world, there is quite some enthusiasm about uh, genetic engineering, is how come that the only GM products on the market are pretty old-fashioned uh, products from the 18s, 80s of the last century? Is this only because of resistance and so on? No, not at all. It is because most of the stuff simply does not work. Even though there has been, have been huge investments in this area, we see now um, companies who have bought up in the course of this whole hype uh, 
Imperia, uh, em, 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 empires of, uh, of seed companies around the world to actually use smarter technologies and resort back to breeding. Most of the money they make is still from conventional breeding and from streamlining this breeding and from yeah, making it more efficient in the way we had uh, uh, discussed it. I think maybe in 20 or 30 years um, we will understand much better what genetic engineering in the clear definition of recombination of an organism in a way that does not occur naturally really means. Maybe in 20 or 30 years we will also find out that certain ways and means of manipulating uh, DNA isn't that dangerous. As long as we don't know, as long as the news coming up about epigenetics, about RNA and iRNA and whatnot, as long as the entire paradigm of microbiology in this area is under reconstruction, I think the approach, the precautionary approach is an imperative because what we are dealing with are organisms, are living beings. They don't have a half lifetime as even nuclear material has and as all chemical compounds have, they have a potential doubling rate. And under these circumstances, this is my personal dogma for the rest of this decade. <laughs> I, uh, just I don't want uh, to see GMOs released into the environment in a way that does not allow us uh, to recall them. Plus, I don't want to see genetic engineering used as a tool to monopolize the very basic uh, basics of our life, which are seeds. I just want to quickly amplify that, uh, which is that um, a Pinot Noir grape has 40,000 genes. We have about 20,000. Uh, so, I mean, to a lot of us, that makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, corn has 35,000 genes. We only have about 20. Um, and now that, we share about 70% of our genes with sea urchins and about 98% with mice. Uh, so clearly the new science, as Benny was saying, indicates that heredity and the secrets of heredity are far beyond our current understanding. Uh, and you have to remember it's not only all that stuff working in the cell. That cell somehow knows one cell with the exact same biological material knows it's going to be a brain cell. The other knows it's going to be a muscle cell. How does it know? We don't know. And, and of course it's working with the inner and outer environment all the time. There is no biology without context. And uh, to answer that very directly, if you get on the Center for Food Safety website, you'll see the materials we've gotten from our lawsuits. The FDA's own scientists, who were then overruled by the political, said that genetic engineering, the process itself, can take a non-toxic food and turn it into toxic food. We've had this with L-tryptophan, which is a non-toxic amino acid supplement that was genetically engineered and led to dozens of deaths and hundreds of, of, of injuries. Uh, it lowers nutrition. This has been peer-reviewed. There's absolutely no question about that. Then we have allergens. Because it's creating new proteins, it conceals old allergens and creates new proteins and therefore new allergens. Because almost every uh, genetically engineered food in the United States has in every cell of that uh, crop and in, in, in the food an antibiotic resistance marker gene. I could later on explain that to people why it's there. Currently, anti antibiotic resistant markers to canamycin and ampicillin. You're getting antibiotic resistant bugs when you eat genetically engineered food. Okay. Uh, additionally, uh, when uh, they put uh, BST into our cows and then took milk from those cows, we now know that that has reproductive problems in human creates reproductive problems in human beings, creates a greater cancer risk, especially for breast and uh, for a number of other cancers, um, including prostate. And uh, w there's a new study that came out of Austria just recently that said that feeding uh, laboratory mice, I believe, or mice or rats. Um, Monsanto's uh, corn led to reproductive problems in, in the uh, mice, and this is consistent with people like Arpad Pushtai and other scientists around the, uh, so you can get that on our website, centerforfoodsafety.org. We only use peer-reviewed science in our stuff. If you're looking for the entire gamut of, of the health effects, I recommend a book called Genetic Roulette uh, by Jeff Smith, which has all the studies in it, both peer-reviewed and non-peer-reviewed as far as 
um, as far as human health impacts of these foods. Um, and you know, when you realize that to, in order to get a gene, let's say a flounder gene into tomatoes, the tomato can grow lower, you attach that g piece of DNA to an agrobacterium vector a bacteria virus vector invades the cell, invades the nucleus, invades the chromosomes, and drops it off in the DNA of the tomato, right? So you've got the, the agrobacterium vector into the, into the cell, invades the cell, drops off the DNA somewhere where they're not sure where. And they, almost every crop out there has something called a cauliflower mosaic virus, which is a virus that promotes the activity of that to produce those proteins. And then you add to that cassette this antibiotic marker uh, I take an, uh, campus in, uh, ampicillin canamycin, uh, and that's the cassette that's going to every cell of that crop. This has never been done before, never been seen before. It is a cell invasion technology, and so it isn't just the, um, the uncertainty of it. It is clearly a, um, a biological disruption, and I think it would be naive indeed to think that that unique biological disruption in every cell of that plant would not have consequences. Before I take the questions at the back, Benny, could I push you on just this? Is, is there a contradiction between what you are saying and Andy is saying? You were saying it's not a food safety issue, and then you raised other issues. And uh, so is it, is it an issue that we do not know what its impacts are, or do you think it's an issue that we do know its impacts and therefore should not? because that seems to be part of the center of the debate. As, as far as um, health is concerned, I mean, um, what we eat today, we humans, uh, is the result of uh, a couple of thousand generations trial and error. And uh, over that time, we've eaten a lot of things which um, proved not to be uh, safe enough to eat, <laughs> and somebody has paid for it. And, um, uh, from my perspective, uh, I think what is very clear is that we don't know, especially the long-term effects when it comes to questions of, of fertility, of uh, build-up of, of allergenicity, and so on and so forth. What we do know is that nobody drops dead when he eats a piece of uh, uh, Roundup Ready soybean or Monsanto's BT uh, maize, uh, obviously, right? What I wanted to say is that from my experience, the resistance against it is not, as has been always emphasized, that people were afraid of eating something uh, which threatens their health. That very much fits into a scientific discourse which says, if I can prove that you don't drop that when you eat it, you must eat it. You can no longer reject it, right? And that discourse which has been, uh, has been pushed by many uh, proponents of GMOs over 15 years and they tried to prove over and over again, you see, you don't drop that, why don't you eat it then, right? Um, it did not did not really uh, reassure the public, and that is uh, and it can be what counterproductive. I, what I'm trying to explain, right? If you want to reduce it to a food safety issue, um, you're you're not uh, looking far enough. No, I think that's a, that's a great point. I've always I, I'll take the questions at the back. I've always found it interesting that we as individuals, no matter where we are, apply the precautionary principle to how we cross the road but not to what we put in our mouth. Mm. Uh, and maybe we aren't fully evolved just yet. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for taking my question. I know we're going over time, so I'll try to keep it short. Um, my question is actually on the flip side of GMOs. And Andy, you were talking in your uh, presentation about organic and that that should be the alternative. Um, my question for you is if you could touch on the issues of organic, especially organic certification, and if that isn't just another way of um, shutting out small farmers and keeping them from succeeding. Thank you. Yeah. Interesting question. Any other question before we ask our panels to just give a one minute, i.e. 60 seconds, wrap up? <laughs> just briefly, having had the opportunity to um, speak to DuPont executives uh, several years ago, uh, I discovered that their passion for these technologies and their belief in them is on an equal level with our passion and belief uh, that they are 
taking the wrong direction. And I think that um, uh, it's, it's interesting, by the way, and I may mention it in my talk this evening, uh, the, the history of the DuPont Company, most people don't realize, in fact, those executives did not know about it, has some roots in natural agriculture going back to, to France. Um, but I think it's, my point here is that um, this is a wonderful group of people, um, but I, I would love to see, uh, and it's the reason I welcome any opportunity not just to speak to you all, but to those who are not thinking the way I do. I would love to have seen that this conversation could take place, and I say this frequently, with uh, a multitude of views present. Because I think these people are not bad people. Uh, and I think they honestly believe that what they are doing is uh, in as great a support for the future of food as what we are discussing here today. So something to think about. Yeah. I, I think your point is well, well taken, and I'm sure my colleagues would also have preferred, liked uh, those other views to be in here. Last question. Thanks. I'll try and make it brief. Um, just sort of elaborating on the question that was asked about golden rice, while these sort of disputes are going on um, in WTO between EU and US and other major exporting countries, um, foundations and now you know, a big move um, and the US federal government um, is to use uh, GMOs as, to, to fund them as a major tool for development for anti-poverty, anti-hunger work in Africa, mm -hmm. um, as well as other developing countries. Um, in other continents, and I'm wondering sort of what the, from the folks from Europe, um, how that's seen politically, et cetera, by the public in um, Europe, whether that's sort of debated as it is starting to be here. Okay, so we have that, that question which wasn't answered the first time and, and, and the other questions. And I, I would, can I also add a question especially for our two European guests because I was left a little confused. Uh, and, and this might have been the gist of Hendrik's question too. From Helen's talk I got the impression maybe wrongly that Europe isn't doing much. And there was a lot of criticism for what, what, what and, and in yours I found this optimism that this is a story that actually a change was made that wouldn't have been ex expected. Uh, and I was trying to figure out which is it, or is it both? It, it, can, it can be both too. But let's start from Andy and then move this way and also your uh, concluding comments, if any. Um, let me, by the way, people who want to become active in this, please get on our website and you can get active in so many ways right now. Very important with the Obama administration is trying to live both supporting organic and supporting biotechnology and they're sort of caught in their own petard, you know, so somewhere between Woodstock and, and, and the Jetsons. Um, uh, no one gets up in the morning wanting to buy a genetically engineered food. No one on earth. Because genetic engineering does absolutely nothing for the eating public. And there's nothing in the pipeline that I see that does that, zero. So why in the world would you buy a food that only offers you risk and no benefit? Very simple. And they're not, there's nothing in the pipeline that would offer you any benefit. And we've looked at all the, all the you can you know, again check our website. So that's why they oppose labeling. That's why they will go to the mat against labeling in this country to rob you of your choice. I do not agree with the prior speaker who said they're as interested in agriculture. No, they're interested in selling chemicals. That's what they do. They are not a public interest organization. They're not a, a members of any kind of public. They are a company, DuPont, Monsanto, who wants to sell more of their chemicals. And to that extent, they have been successful. It's our judge to say whether that's good for us or bad for us, and I certainly think it's bad for us. And the reason that I haven't debated a Monsanto person in the last 10 years is because they've refused to debate me in the last 10 years, uh, by the way. Uh, and I'm sure if you'd asked them to be on this panel with me, and per certainly with the other one, they would have said no, because they're not interested in this discourse. They're interested in continuing their myth. That it fi the, uh, the Union Concerned Scientists came out with a wonderful study. It's going to be in a peer-reviewed journal that no increase of yield whatsoever has been associated with biotechnology. Just came out, Union of Concerned Scientists, peer reviewed. So it's a myth that there's more yield. It does, so I think it's really important to say this is about the real world, not science fiction, not golden rice, which turned out to be a complete public relations thing and nothing to do with reality. Right? This is about chemical companies selling more and more chemicals. That's why 81% of all the plants out there have that as their primary. And I think the reason they don't want labeling, another reason they don't want labeling is traceability of health impacts. Right? If you're a mother and, and you feed your child soy formula and the child develops a rash or develops an illness, 
You take it to your pediatrician, you say, well, I don't know if this is genetically engineered or not, right? We've had a huge increase in allergic reactions the last 10 years, but because we have no traceability through labeling, if you said, listen, this is labeled GMO, then the, your pediatrician, oh, that's the third one that's coming this week of this particular GMO. But without traceability, we cannot know the health impacts and also the companies escape liability. That's why they will do anything to stop us from our right to know about this. Otherwise, if they thought this was so great and they could advertise it, they'd want it labeled. They'd want you to know so you would buy their food. All right? So these are some of the very obvious uh, you know, things that we deal with. Uh, you know, I, I also want to agree, though, I think that the reason I was just in Africa, I was just in Ethiopia, Kenya, and South Africa, and the Gates Foundation, which has put $150 million behind this technology and, and numerous others you know, in Africa and elsewhere, what comes along with this technology? Genetic engineering. Well, herbicides, pesticides, fertilizers, all of their products. They're just simply trying to break into new markets under the guise of feeding the world when we have peer-reviewed studies that show without question it doesn't increase yield or do anything. So the, the new markets are looking at us, new markets for, their, for industrial agriculture, this model we were talking about. So I really want to go on with Benny saying this isn't just about genetic engineering. Genetic engineering is the latest version of this industrial model of life, this industrial model of trying to subdue nature to create sustainability instead of work with nature. And it's the most aggressive, invasive, and intimately invasive there is, but it goes along with all the others to this other worldview. And I hope that the organic and beyond worldview is the one that is, I think it's the only sustainable one, so it's really our only future, but I think the more and more of us that realize that, the better off we'll be. Helen? Um, yes, I wanted to say on the um, developing country um, angle, we looked at the research pipelines of all the major biotech com companies to exactly see what they're doing, because you hear a lot about how GM crops, maybe now it's not great, but in the future. So we looked at what's actually being done. And what you see is that there's, there is R&D being done on traits such as salt tolerance, drought resistance, but it's tiny and it's nowhere near the market. And in fact, by doing this small piece of research, small part of research, it allows the corporations to say, look at the promise, look at the promise. The only thing is, is they've been saying this now for, what, 30 years or more, and they've not got anywhere nearer the market. Even the articles that you may read recently about some drought-resistant maize about to uh, come onto the market, it's not about to come on the market because it's still in the trial phase. But this never comes out. The detail never actually comes out. And the vast share of R&D going on in the corporations, as others have said, is, is herbicide-tolerant crops or insect-resistant. And this is what enables them to further their agrochemical market. And when we put out this research, um, some, a colleague of mine was actually talking to somebody in one of the corporations who said that it caused a lot of concern in the corporation who didn't actually, who refused to comment publicly on it because basically know that we're onto something on this. That basically they've got a little bit of research but it's not going anywhere, but it allows them to spin GM crops as good for developing countries. So I think this is a really important angle on what um, has been spun even with greater enthusiasm during the food price crisis. Whereas if you look at what came out of the food price crisis, you can see that the profits of the agrochemical companies, biotech companies, increased, increased exponentially <coughs> as they further increased the chemical costs, further increased the seed costs, and these are the guys that really benefited from the recent food price crisis. And then the other thing on the question about Europe, um, yes, I think Benny and I showed you some of the different angles in Europe, um, which I think is important to get across. Um, I think it would be wrong to have a black and white image that everything's perfect in, in Europe, that the resistance is 100%, that we've got total support from all scientists and all politicians. So, And also because there was, I think, going to be somebody from the European Food Safety Authority on this panel originally, and I was expecting that person to give a very different view, and I felt that they needed to be a little little bit of a two-sided version, but I think that what Benny says is extremely true, and if you look at the figures um, of just how much is under cultivation, that there's nothing on the shelves, that as soon as the Commission or parts of the Commission try and force GM into Europe, there's a public outcry, um, and it, that essentially Europe is GM-free, which is important for Europe, which is important for the US, but it's also important for developing countries, and I, I, there I would maybe disagree with you, but, but comrades and colleagues in Africa and other countries um, also want to be GM free and 
we try and build global solidarity with them. I, I think a lot of them do, but a lot of them get very worried that both the US view and the EU view is kicking developing countries around. It's one more sort of, maybe we are too colonially inspired. Uh, but uh, <laughs> maybe I've given you something to say. <laughs> yes, I, I have something to say about that, because uh, when you look at the global situation, um, the majority of genetic engineers today are Chinese. And uh, the second uh, biggest uh, number comes from India. And both of them are publicly funded. So they are not uh, pawns of Monsanto in their entirety, even though Monsanto has bought up the biggest uh, Indian seed company, Maiko there still is genuinely publicly funded research in both of these uh, countries. So I don't think that you need to worry too much uh, about uh, just being kicked around between uh, Europe and uh, the US. Um, you will, however, see a debate here in, uh, in the US, I guess, in the first place, about how to deal with genetically engineered products from China and uh, India, which are not coming from Monsanto, uh, which are not coming from a US uh, lab. And you will be surprised about uh, the food safety and other uh, concerns that will be raised within the next five years in AFIS, FDA, and all the other agencies uh, here in uh, in the US. The other question that I had left open was on the golden rice. I've looked at this um, quite intensively because at the time it was first announced, which was, I believe, in 1997, if I'm not mistaken, or 98. Um, I was heading the GMO campaign of Greenpeace International and I felt this is a real thing to, to look at, right? There is one thing what we feel concerned about in terms of environmental issues, but on the other side, if there is an application that may save uh, the eyesight or the, uh, the uh, um, health of uh, many people who suffer from vitamin A deficiency, especially in developing countries, this is certainly a different type of uh, um, cost-benefit um, discussion than uh, when you talk about herbicide-tolerant uh, plants to be grown in the Midwest or not. I talked to Mr. Potricus, the inventor of this uh, golden rice, at length and for many occasions. And to cut the long story short, for the first seven years, this rice simply did not work. It did not provide. I once did a press conference where I simply piled up the amount of rice that would have been necessary to eat every day in order to consume the WHO recommended daily intake of pro, pro vitamin, B, uh, vitamin B, right, which leads to vitamin A. And these were uh, 3.2 kilogram of dry rice, right? <laughs> now, this is not exactly the, the daily diet, especially of poor people in uh, developing countries, and few people managed to eat these amounts anyway, right? Then Syngenta, which had taken over from Potricus, because Potricus had run into the problem of having violated 70 different patents. He gave the whole thing to Syngenta and said, you sort this out. Syngenta holding, I don't know, maybe a quarter or half of these patents anyway, and they have established a humanitarian board, and they're based with IRI now, the International Rice Research Institute, which is being funded since now more than eight years to develop this uh, golden rice. Syngenta redesigned this golden rice completely, and now they have apparently uh, come up uh, with a variety that would provide the necessary amount of provitamin B at all. Well. This year, for the first time, it will be field tested in the United States of America. Um, over the, and what you have to keep in mind 
is what this vitamin A, this golden rice would do should it ever be commercialized, is replace the intake of three carrots. And the, and the ideology behind that is we cannot change the fact that people go poor and have no access to, to uh, fresh produce, right? Let's face it, millions of people in the world have rice and nothing else. So let's engineer everything into this rice those poor people only can afford in order to prevent them from dying. I don't think that this is the way we want to go. Where such supplements are necessary, vitamin A um, supplements are available at minimal prices uh, from Roche and other uh, chemical producers and they're handed out since, since many years by the WHO. Over these 12 years that we've been discussing now Golden Rice, WHO has actually made quite a bit of progress in this specific area of what is called food fortification, right? And you don't need to genetically engineer a piece of rice, you could even add it. Uh, for instance, sugar is, is a typical uh, medium for fortification and, uh, and so on and so forth. We do it so, with salt forever. Pardon? We have done it with salt forever. You do it with salt forever. You don't need to try and genetically engineer your salt for that purpose. Even, yeah, you had a <laughs> probably no good luck anyway. <laughs> so that's the story of, of, of this golden rice. And it hasn't come on the market until today, right? At the same time, Mr. Potricus next week will hold a convention at the Pontifical Academy of Sciences uh, with um, 40 other men and one woman where they will exclusively discuss how to overcome regulations that in his eyes have stopped beneficial genetic engineering products such as golden rice uh, from coming to the market. The only woman involved in this is a Mrs. Feodorov, who is the uh, scientific advisor of Mrs. Clinton. Um, Mrs. Clinton has inherited her from Mrs. Uh, Rice, and who is one of those persons who appear in European newspapers, say every four weeks or so, in an interview, accusing uh, Europeans and environmentalists of preventing all much needed progress in this area. And it is true, there are people who believe, who genuinely believe in what a wonderful thing they are doing, even though I have to say there were many more 20 years ago than there are today. Um, the question from my point of view is where can we, where can we have where can we meet on this issue? And I've been talking to many people, be it from Monsanto, Syngenta, BASF, Bayer, and so on and so forth, over the time. And the basic problem I see is this. If there is no product, a company, not because they're bad and because they are profit-driven uh, uh, and whatever, yeah, because they have, in order to survive, they have to provide products. Any simple method to improve your yield, any simple method to improve your health, any simple method that can be shared is a threat to their profit. And that is the basic contradiction, which I don't want to blame anybody personally in any of these companies, but we, which we need to resolve and which some of these companies try to resolve by patenting, saying, okay, if there is no product, then I want to patent the knowledge. Then you will need to wrap up. Yes, I'll wrap up. <laughs> and, uh, and what you have at the moment, right, are dozens of patents on individual DNA traits of major food crops, which may have something to do with drought tolerance, salt uh, tolerance, flood uh, resistance, and so on and so forth. That is dangerous, I think. 
we have to find a way out of that. I think on that happy note that we do have to find uh, a way out of this, but I think that's a very important note. I want to thank all three of my panelists. Pick up on something that, pick up on uh, something that Benny, uh, Benny, Benny said, the issue, uh, issue will become bigger. And I think you, you raised a very, very good point that, that in some ways all of you, you raised that, that this is not an issue that's going away, uh, particularly the trade aspect of it as China starts producing more of it, as India starts producing more of it, uh, Brazil, Argentina, it's going to become a bigger debate than it is, and therefore we should be keeping an eye on the debate. Thank you very much. We will break for, uh, for 10 minutes, and we should be back for the next panel, which is going to be very exciting. Thank you. Thank you all.